Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, sometimes necessity is the mother of invention, and you just have to do things yourself. And if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you are in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I am your host for this podcast, where we talk to a wide-ranging variety of entertainment industry professionals and pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, inspirations, the whole nine yards. And if you'd like to subscribe to us, you can find us over at Apple, over at Spotify, and you'll find everything archived over on our YouTube channel at In The Seats. Also, if you could throw us a follow on the social media, that would be appreciated over on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at either In The Seats or at It's Podcast One. And finally, please come to where it all began, over at In The Seats, intheseats.ca, for all the latest and greatest movie news, reviews, and all sorts of fun stuff with our hardworking team. On this episode, we're getting a little do-it-yourself, we're getting a little experimental, we're getting a little weird, but we're getting really interesting as well, as uh, we're looking at Death and Sickness, which is debuting on uh, the CBC Gem streaming platform as of Friday, November 20th, and it is a film by uh, Canadian filmmakers Sookie Lee and Dylan Gamble, and it's not just, they're not just filmmakers, they... They acted in it, they directed it, they did the camera work, they did the sound work, they composed it, they edited it, they they did everything, because they did it during lockdown. They shot a film in their house during lockdown. And like I say, it's, it's, it's the kind of film, it's not going to be for everyone, I'm just, I will go out there right now and say it. But it's really interesting because it really takes a look at kind of the headspace that a lot of us were in, especially on the early days of uh, of COVID and those initial days of lockdown when we were all kind of freaking out, not knowing how to navigate the situation. And these two these two artists really managed to capture that environment pretty well, and they add so many more layers to it as well. And it's a uh, it's an interesting character study, and it's an interesting testament to the spirit of do-it-yourself and, you know, just sort of getting out there and creating your art. And we talked to them, and they had a lot to say on the subject. And uh, I hope you enjoy because I know I did. All right. Now, I mean, first off, congratulations. I absolutely loved it because, I mean, I think while it's a little gonzo, I think it really does sort of capture that internal monologue that we were all having with with ourselves when we realized that oh wait sort of the day-to-day routine is gone this is that we have to sort of live inside our own minds can you walk me through sort of the initial inspiration for the story because there's obviously a bit of truth in it but you definitely take it to some fun places yeah i, I guess the uh, original inspiration was the fact that um we were going to be facing lockdown um i had a feeling like in early January that shit was going to hit the fan. Yeah. Um, Dylan was often saying to me, Oh my God, what are you obsessing about the coronavirus back when it was, always, you know, known as the coronavirus. Yeah. Um, I had done like a stand up comedy routine and completely um, ended up skewering the virus and trying to spread sickness into the audience. I don't know if it aged very well, that, that, that thing. So the virus itself and the impending lockdown really was um, a, a great catalyst. But in terms of the actual story, I had gone through quite uh, honestly the worst couple of years of my life prior to the pandemic. I had um, lost my job, um, uh, separated from my partner, and then also my partner, um, Adam Blitovitz, who was, we were very, very close for, for, 12 years we were together and even after we passed we were each other's best friends um he passed away and i was really having a very challenging time dealing with his his passing yeah. so when the uh, pandemic came came up it was like you know it was almost a cakewalk by comparison to what had happened in the the previous two years and dylan and i had recently met and um we met through a friend of mine who is a karaoke queen, Sarah, okay. and she was really <laughs> helpful in my 
um, she was a real great support to me. And she pretty much dragged me out one night when I was very, very down to go watch her karaoke. And um, that was at Handlebar. Um, and they have a karaoke night and Dylan was working at Handlebar. And I, I, for some reason, I magnetically moved toward him. Uh, we ended up talking and hitting it off. And he was also going through stuff and we became each other's support systems. Um, I was singing in Kate Bush. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what it was. I forgot. <laughs> that was, I think that was the ticket. Yeah, he was up there singing Kate Bush. Um, what was the song again? <laughs> Babushka. Right. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> it was it was harder, harder than I thought it Can would be. Can you do it again? <laughs> it's too early. It's too he's, early. he's just got back from like eight days of no talking oh, yeah. and he came to my house yesterday and I was like, what happened to you? Cause his voice was like three octaves <laughs> lower. B Babushka requires really yeah. high notes. Right. Yeah. So I guess not talking so long in this last week. Yeah. I went to my apartment for a week to just generate synthesizer tones. So then when I got back, I was like, Oh, that's a strange world to be in. And then my voice dropped, I guess, while I was doing that. <laughs> so he was singing, um, Babushka, 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 yeah, yeah. That's, that's and I remember putting on my story, <laughs> it was like I was, I put on my Instagram story, Kate Bush is in handlebar. <laughs> 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 um, and I love the fact that he was singing Kate Bush. And so we, we became very, 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 very fast friends. Um, when the pandemic hit, uh, he was on tour with his band Hot Garbage going to play South by Southwest and I was in Detroit and Windsor. Um, we both ended up having to hightail it back to Toronto. Uh, Dylan canceled the tour, came back. We both quarantined for two weeks. And during that time, it was like, holy sheesh, this is going to be bad. Do you want to do you want to lock down together and see, you know, basically it, it be each other's support. Right. This bizarre yeah. time where, you know where we need we need people but we can't be around people so um so we decided to we agreed to lock down together and he came over um and you know i i had been asked prior by ingrid veninger who's a real diy filmmaker she had invited me to contribute a short film to a pandemic anthology that she was making and my mind was really all over the place um and i didn't think that i'd be able to turn it around in the tight turnaround that she required and I also didn't feel that a story could fit within 10 minutes. It would be, you know, it just, I had way more to say. And I, you know, I, I think I'm more partial to a long format film. Okay. But okay. as she um, invited me, I, I declined. Um, I, you know, I, I said I wasn't able to do it. I, I wasn't sure. And she said, okay, we got to move on without you, Sukin. But <laughs> during that time, I had percolated the idea of a movie. And that was very much, um, you know, what would it be? It was a work of auto fiction, really mining um, the difficult times of the last two years and the idea of two people, Dylan and I, kind of people who just met, thrown together, deciding to lock down, two kind of messed up people deciding to lock down in a tiny row house together. Um, one person, me, mourning the loss of my love, one, Adam, and then Dylan in his array of his constellation of <laughs> anxieties and fears and strange things. Well, it's kind of at the beginning, there's this funny thing that's like, she's very um, concerned with the pandemic. Yeah. And then I come in, I'm like, this musician dude is like, I don't have to go to work and they're going to pay me. This is like all I ever wanted. <laughs> and then obviously right, there's like, well, it's kind of a horrifying circumstance for that, but they're kind of like not really on the same worry level at all. They're very different. Yeah, I'm completely uh, over worrisome and um, trying to manage everything with the all the groceries and stuff. Whereas Dylan, and quite truthfully, you know, he was pretty much working hard labor, you know, juggling two jobs, yeah. both of which were incredibly physically arduous. And um, when the pandemic happened, he was like, oh, phew, I can breathe for a second. So, um, you know, the, the it just seemed that just being guided by real life, um, you know, and then being able to um, draw upon documentary, real life, and also fiction um, was the way to go. So it is really a work of autofiction. 
Well, I mean, I think a lot of that really does get encapsulated in just sort of the spirit of, of the tone of the film in the Google song with the two of you sitting on the floor <laughs> in the Google song. I mean, I think that's <laughs> that really it almost kind of encapsulates <laughs> sort of the entire emotion, especially from a pandemic standpoint of, of how <laughs> people have felt and how, how they do feel. I'm curious, Dylan, from your perspective, like, did you know what you were getting into when you when you moved in? Uh, well, I was I was stoked because we'd wanted to do something for a really long time, but I like I had been working so much that I didn't have any time. So I was like, I don't know, like I showed up and I think two days later we just started shooting. And then I'm like, okay, movie, let's start writing it. And I was like, I have been so ready to just do something. Yeah, because working two jobs, yeah. he was being robbed of creative time. Mm -hmm. So the odd thing was suddenly with this horrifying pandemic, he had all the creative time in yeah, the world. Yeah, so I, it was funny because we were like so insular. You're like, is this a terrible movie or a great movie? And every night we were like watching, we bought like Criterion Channel. So every night we were just like watch really great stuff and then get up and start shooting pretty yeah, much. Yeah, it was pretty much boot movie making boot camp yeah it was great i felt like i was at film school for free like when dylan arrived with his two keyboards two days later i'm like can you dress exactly how you arrived get your keyboards and arrive again and i'll shoot you and he's like what that, these yeah. are heavy that part <laughs> that sucked i had to pack up again I, he said can i fill the keyboard cases with pillows instead i'm like oh, oh okay. yeah okay <laughs> i forgot i forgot i did that and then the next morning i woke up early and i shot the first scene of the movie so it was pretty much like in this abyss of uncertainty and horror, we were like, gotta make a movie. So it was really like um, a way of, you know, focusing our energy and time and kind of pouring pouring our our energy and the creativity into this work. And, and it gave a kind of structure to these days of like uncertainty. So was the fridge bit sort of staged or was that an actual problem you had with the fridge? Yes, it, no, that it's happened. totally. Yeah. <laughs> because it was kind of like okay well we draw upon whatever happens and when the fridge like the crazy thing was i was like okay dylan's coming over and like in those early days it was like i was literally feeling like i had to like make a compound and you know like go and, and the, everything in my house was breaking down like first it felt all it was like the 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 drain broke the, and then i had to, i had to fix the drain and then and oh, then and the, the drain thing happened like the day after we watched Solaris, like the Tarkovsky one. And the plumber came and he was this Russian guy who was really nice. But the drain was so old that he like accidentally hacks out his hand and he was like bleeding was all bleeding. over the place. Oh, no. I, had like, I had to like fix him. And I was like, he oh was my really God. Good, he did a good job. He did, he did great. But he was like, he was bleeding everywhere. And I was like, oh my God, I had to be like a nurse. Um, but I forgot to roll the cameras. We would have incorporated that. Yeah. But then when the fridge broke down, like the next day, because I was like, go, you know, we got to go grocery shopping forever. And then um, I was, you know, chipping away at this ancient fridge, all the ice, and did the, you know, the, the cliche mistake of hitting the Freon line. And the fridge just went boom. And that's the only fridge that I have in it. And I was like, Oh my God. Leaking poison gas. <laughs> it was leaking poison gas all over me. And I was like, I so fucked up. The pandemics happened and I ruined the fridge. I'm not allowed what to go outside and I'm covered in Freon. So I can't. I yeah, can't pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So when that happened, we were like, okay, this is a good conflict point. Uh, just, we're just going to like document. <laughs> and then, I'll, and then Dylan was like, let's really document it. Dylan's really into this super freaky shit. And yeah, I, tried to, I wanted to keep it as weird as possible. And he's oh. like, what about a scene in the fridge? I'm like, mm. I was, I thought that it'd be good if the, the fridge was like, I like like old horror movies. And like, I thought maybe the fridge brings in this ancient evil energy. <laughs> I don't know. No, but I mean, I, I, I loved sort of, I love that you mentioned Criterion Channel and Tartowski. Cause I mean, there are some scenes it's a little silly okay you're just running around the house but then there's a, there's other scenes where it's like oh my god they pulled this from stalker it's like oh you know this, it, it i was really quite impressed with the production value of the film and I mean, oh, you're, you're the first person we've talked to and we're not sure 
it, you know, it's like if good, it's a uh, complete no, I mean, embarrassment for us, or I'm just gonna high five Dylan. <laughs> it's pure DIY, but I mean, it it, it looks good. I mean, I the situation you. you're in, and I mean, it's it's one of those things where it really sort of, at least for me, looking at it goes, sort of reinvigorates the spirit of sort of DIY filmmaking, which we tend to lose a little bit of these days, especially in the sort of days of, and I hate the word content, but you know, with, with the Netflixes and the everythings of the world sort of barfing content out at audiences <laughs> at, at nauseam, people forget about the artistry that is capable thanks to sort of the technology that we have in our hands. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed, but I mean, I've been parts of like I hosted the Venus Fest, which is like a totally awesome like women's music festival. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, they they had a live stream, and it was total cable TV. My friend um, Becky Johnson, who's a comedian, she does a live variety show with other comedians. That is totally old school, totally um, low tech um, <laughs> uh, aesthetics, and it's so fun. It's so great. Um, uh, yeah, our movie is not, it doesn't even, I mean, it looks great because I have these DSLR cameras that, you know, we can get pretty cheap consumer cameras that have a beautiful image. Yeah, um, yeah. So we used uh, the, I have a tiny little consumer model Osmo Steadicam that is gorgeous. And we're shooting a music video with it right now. Um, and then also a couple of DSLR cameras. Um, the only problem was my DSLR cameras had pixel dead pixels. So there were these white horrible pixels that we shot the first third of the movie with, and then I bought a new camera, but then we had to go in and post and get rid of the dead pixels. So the version you saw, we got rid of the dead pixels. Um, but other than that, I mean, the image was beautiful. We decided as a formalist to sort of rule that whenever we walked around, we would go take epic um, sort of wanderings when nobody was around outside when it, you know, it was pretty much like, a ghost town um, that I would use my cell phone camera. So, uh, you know, uh, purposely, um, you know, very uh, degraded um, uh, cell phone audio for the moments that we were in the world. But other than that, everything is, um, everything is very gorgeously rendered. I mean, I did edit the whole movie on iMovie on my home computer. <laughs> that was the scariest part. <laughs> that was terrifying. It was terrifying because- <laughs> Not um, recommended. I put it in there and I love iMovie, but then after a while, it was really having, it was laboring because it was so full and it wouldn't export. Oh, no, and no, no. every, <laughs> every single day I'd be, I'd be up, up, cause I'd be like tweaking the edit. And then I tried to export. And sometimes on a good day it would, on a bad day it wouldn't. And I was very harrowing. And then finally, I, I wouldn't export at all because I, I, well, I went online and I saw one thread and it was like, never make a movie longer than nine minutes on <laughs> iMovie. It can't take it. This was like 80. Um, and then another thread that I saw that basically said, um, if you can't export, it means that you want to, you know, there maybe some, some of the raw material has been corrupted. <clears throat> Go through your entire um, line and see if there's any black frames. And at 24 frames per second and an 80 minute movie, you can That's imagine wild. scrolling. <laughs> but I found two black frames. And I, when I switched those two frames out, then I could export. Oh. And, but by then I was like, it was toward the end of making the movie and I was completely stressed out. Dylan would walk in and I, I'd be holding a bizarre posture at my computer terrible posture very <laughs> unhealthy behavior for like eight hours sitting there it was sort of the computer was sort of like a horse that gets you through the epic battle and then dies immediately when it gets you like to the other side kind of thing yeah We're that's down. like another <laughs> yeah, like never ended story no, well that's like also that guy that that movie um the hero and horse oh that's yeah you yeah. know uh, what by what's his name um who are we watching a lot of? Oh, uh, Bellatar. Yeah, Bellatar. Yeah. It was now, dark, I mean, yeah. On, on something like this, because, I mean, obviously you've got a frame of what you want to do, but how much is scripted and how much is sort of the two of you riffing back and forth off each other? Well, it was a lot of the, like, there was the premise, and I told Dylan that, and he was like, yeah, okay, I like this premise. Uh, but making sure that it goes into, has good flights of fancy into the surreal. We're not being too, too, too precious about it. He wants humor. I was like, okay, good, good. 
And then one day we just locked myself, locked ourselves in my office and eked out a treatment, an arc. He had ideas to bring to the whole narrative that were very exciting to me, uh, specifically flights of fancy and, and, and specifically um, like what we're looking at is a portrait of pandemic world, but also really our only kind of escape from this reality was to create a, our own reality, yeah. was to create our own world through imagination. So the movie digresses into spaces of intergalactic space travel. Um, we, we time traveled to the middle ages. It was a real kind of, um, it was fun, but also a political and, and social statement of like, how do you, how do you, how do you continue and thrive within a, a horrible situation where you can also, you can, you can make the world of your own imagination. So, um, you know, in, in that, I think it was a couple of days that we were just like carved out the, the, the treatment, you know, the arc of the events and where the story would go, the beginning, the middle, the end, and all the scenes in between. So we had that knowledge and then we would start writing. writing yeah, we were scenes. still writing as we shot, but we had the skeleton idea kind of thing. Right. Yeah, we had all the events and then I would set to writing a, uh, a, uh, the, you know, what I proposed as, as a scene and then I'd send it to Dylan and then he'd add and then he'd send it back to me and back and forth until the scene was good. And then we'd go and shoot it. And then we knew looking at our template where we would go next. And then again, start that process. I would, as after we shot it, I would edit, he would go make the music, start, start making the music. Um, and then after I'd edit, re revisit the next scene in terms of perhaps it would have been written or maybe not. Mm. And then back and forth like that. So it was very much, it was a, a different process. All of my uh, previous movies have started from, you know, a lock stripped and then you go, and then you go make it, which is a much more sort of militaristic way of right. doing it. Um, it's sort of like a manufacturing kind of automated model of uh, development. We had assembly line like, going for a while when we were really good. <laughs> ours was an assembly line of kind of two people, much more like a Kool-Aid stand. Yeah, you know, and it's just one day, one day, the only day you have to shoot outside, it's like a, during a heat wave and you're wearing a Victorian outfit. And you're like, I could have planned this better. Yeah, it was like, it was, it was a little, um, you know, it was like, I have a very loud furnace. And the <laughs> first, there was a few key scenes in the beginning that all you could hear was like, <laughs> And, and so we, I, I was like, holy shit, this is going to be really loud. So it was like, how do we, how do we work around this furnace? Well, we start the whole movie with a picture of the furnace so that people know where that sound is coming from. And we also ended up having to redub the scenes that were way too blown away by the furnace where, where the furnace was upstaging. Okay. The furnace <laughs> also could have been an evil entity like the fridge, but exactly. we never actually right. talked about it. Yeah. No, and Dylan was always about like the house, um, imbibing the house with a character as well. I wanted to get at least a little bit of the Shining vibe because of the lockdown, like like cabin fever. I think you were one step away from being House, the Japanese horror movie from 1970. Oh, we watched that. Like, you were so close to that. <laughs> you, there was a know? bit of that vibe coming through. <laughs> yeah, that was one of the most fun movies we watched for sure, actually. Yeah, we were really, the stuff that was really speaking to us was a kind of... Um, you know, Tarkovsky-esque sort of sci-fi world, but organic sci-fi world. And also like very new, I, I mean, it really ping pongs in a lot of spaces. There's sometimes it's very neutral and very beautiful, beautiful moments of um, stark uh, beauty and ugliness in one. And then sometimes it's just silly. Like we're, we're both really silly and funny people. So we really wanted to keep that bounce in there you know, in terms of like physical comedy and stuff like that. And then there's forays into, into to horror and then very strange, like on um, the whole sort of back end in terms of a philosophical, I don't even know what you would call that sort of back end of where we go into, into a kind of other, other very unusual liminal space with the spirits of uh, my ancestors, my, my loved ones who have passed. Does the core of sort of 
creativity in general just come down to the sheer fact of shutting up and doing it? Because a lot of times people will bemoan that, oh, I'm not being creative, I'm not doing this, or there's stuff going on, and yada, yada, yada. A lot of times, at least even from my perspective, I've found that some of the best and most interesting stuff comes out of just going, fuck it, I'm going to try it and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny in retrospect, like some of the decisions we made and we were just both like, yeah, that's, the th that's what we should do, because it seems kind of so funny now. <laughs> So I think we were kind of in a very specific headspace, but yeah. Um. Usually it's like when I've made movies, it's with a huge team. Right. You know? And it's like um, just the development of the script takes years and you have lots of people chiming in on what you think, you know, your producers will send it out to readers who give you their, your, their two cents. So it's a real long and lengthy um, development process. Uh, whereas this one was like, okay, I got the, I got the cameras. I got the computer. I got the zoom recording device. Let's make a movie. <laughs> Sukin, yeah. I would say Sukin has probably the craziest follow through of anyone I've ever met. Like it would be, we're shoot. Okay. We'll shoot today. And then I'm like, okay, we'll shoot today. And then it's like eight hours later and she's like still editing. And she, it's kind of, she gets very, in the zone like to the point where i'm like okay i gotta be on all the time ready to work <laughs> and it was kind of fun you were, you were good at that because he'd never he'd never acted or made a movie what? ever okay. yeah I, I liked photography in high school and that was like kind of the last time i really watched a lot of art house was when i was in high school and then i basically barely watched any movies for 10 years came over here she's a huge cinephile she showed me all the school stuff and i was like oh yeah art house it's the best and then just got to be like, oh yeah, I used to like photography. So that was. And then when I started shooting him, I was like, fuck, he is amazing. What a pure and open expression. It startled me because I was like, dude, you're better, you're better in these scenes than I am. And I'm supposed to be the professional actor. Working in the service industry. That's what he said. He said <laughs> Any, act anyone from a restaurant can kind of probably act okay, at least a little bit. <laughs> you have to all the time. <laughs> So his, he, Dylan is a non-actor and I do find this as a filmmaker. I'm not, like, usually the non-actors have such a, like children as well, just like a very, um, very pure and, and ability to like be in the moment and respond honestly. And so he really demanded that of me in the scene. Um, so it was really exciting to work with him. And, and also huge learning curve. Like I've made movies, but I've never had to like, I've, I've never had to shoot my own movies. So it was very much a lesson on, you know, in the beginning, we were just like being pretty, pretty not vigilant over where we were putting the recorder. So a lot of the sound was off mic. So we'd have to like <laughs> re-dub yeah, our yeah, voices. Yeah. Um, and we were really learning tons, tons. Like just even like having to set up a shot and like get the angles right and, and know that you're shooting yourself as well and sometimes we'd, we'd be playing multiple roles talking like in the same scene I would there, there's some scenes where I'm playing many roles talking right. to each other so all of that stuff was very good for my filmmaking um, ability and also you know I like the DIY way like I grew up in Vancouver and and um, I came out of a underground music scene and um, do it yourself you know I think I think in terms of art that's kind of a, a big part of art making is, is doing it yourself now, especially with the pandemic. Well, and so, and so many people forget what a creative boost problem solving can be, especially when you're sort of in the middle of trying to get a shot, because I mean, like you say, your house is basically 11 feet wide. And then there was the shot of you coming <laughs> up the stairs and I was like, Oh shit, how did they do that? <laughs> well, it's funny. Like, most, most of the scenes in the movie, I would say were not actually acting together right like the other person has to handle the gear so a lot of the time you're literally staring at a wall like half the movie is just like not actually i'm like i'm like, like over look at this spot here this is me and so is like just so you know normally if you're like an actor you have yeah, someone yeah, to yeah. act with i am i'm follow me yeah yeah like look yeah it's basically like, look over here like okay that doesn't look right like look over here okay that, maybe that's where they're standing Kind of all right now i mean just to put a bow on this because i don't want to take up too much more of your time uh 
I would like, I love the movie. I, I love sort of the DIY aesthetic and I love that you did everything, but there's one question I do have because I didn't notice it on the credits. Who did the catering? <laughs> um, like Chinatown. <laughs> yeah, we have Chinatown a lot of bunny, bunny, bo- bu- bunny bo- <laughs> What are they called again? Bunny bands? Bon me? Bon me? Bon me boys? Bon, yeah, bon me boys. Okay, yeah. Bon me boys, or like yeah. those little, you know, oh, sandwiches. If you want to give a shout out to Pan Pan Noodle, Involvement oh, yeah. Village, oh. and Dumplings and More. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Dundas and Spadina. That's, yeah. We ate that a lot. <laughs> are we eating very well? We did. Yeah, well, at first we had to eat well because it was too dangerous to go get food, I think. So we would actually at it beca- at the beginning it was horrible because we had to, like one day we'd just be getting stuff and washing it. Yeah. And then we like couldn't keep track of everything we were buying and so Yeah, you, there's that one scene where I'm terrified. And this is actual documentary footage that I shot on my cell phone, where I'm literally in Chinatown grabbing handfuls of like bok choy, bok choy, choy and yeah. throwing it into my my bag my canvas shopping bag i was so terrified of even like being slow like or putting it in a plastic bag i was just like grabbing handfuls of like raw vegetables and throwing it in the box it's madness also showed it to the aeropress the coffee thing (laughs) (laughs) but and you know what i mean and that really does sort of encapsulate sort of the mood of it all because there were those moments at the beginning where like i remember my first trip to the store i was terrified it was it was it was a stressful experience yeah but, you know, but the more you get into it and the more you sort of had your moment of self-introspection and then sort of made your own peace with it that's what helped you move on and i mean i think i think this film really does sort of capture the mindset of the stress that we've really all been kind of feeling and it's it's a wonderful thing and i just want to say thanks again for the work and for the time today oh thank you so much it makes me so happy that you were able to relate to it because that was the hope as well i mean it's a very personal story but i always find that the most more specific you are the more universal it is um and so the idea that it does reflect your own experience is really awesome Dave. and it's honest it comes through it really does Thank, uh, it's a relief that you liked. Yeah, because we're I mean, like we haven't this, had much feedback at all. Yet. You're the first person to actually tell us your opinion. Well, I'm glad we started off strong. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> all right, but thanks again for the time, guys.